Good evening and welcome to tonight's event, which is part of the University of York's autumn term series of university-wide open lectures. I'm Mary Garrison from the History Department and the Centre for Medieval Studies here. I'm delighted to introduce our speaker, Professor Sue Westhausen. She is Emeritus Professor of Medieval Archaeology at the University of Cambridge and a Fellow of the Society of Antiquaries of London. Her research spans archaeology, history, and historical geography, and her most recent books are on the Anglo-Saxon Fenland and the emergence of the English, and that book is the subject of her lecture tonight. I was captivated by the elegance and timeliness of that book. It brings a fresh and very humane, even concrete perspective rooted in daily life, social relationships, and even cooking apples to a very old problem, um, the problem of how we identify the emergence of the English. That problem still resonates with so many contemporary concerns about what the way we think of human migration, collective identity, and changes in culture and politics. Those questions right now can be acutely troubling. And so it's especially wonderful to have a solution to that old historical problem that imagines the topic in an entirely different way. Um, and the title of Professor Osthausen's lecture tonight is The Emergence of the English and a very warm welcome. Hello everyone, thank you for coming. It's a nice thing to be doing indoors on a day like this. It's been cold but lovely down here in the south. I hope it's been just as lovely up where you are. So here's my lecture. It's going to be just part of my book. Just the first part because there's enough time to do everything, but I hope it will whet your interest. So, this is the structure basically of where we're going to be going this evening. I've got an introduction. I want to say something about the evidence for um, early, early um, Germanic immigration into early medieval England under four headings, the documentary evidence, the archeological evidence, the genomic evidence, and the linguistic evidence. And then I'd like to draw some clues, conclusions about, it, about its strength. So here's the introduction. So I want to talk about four things here. The earliest evidence, something about interpretations, the premises and assumptions that I'm making as I go along, and the questions that I hope to be answering or at least asking during the, during the next 45 minutes or so. Well, one of the great problems of British cultural history concerns the emergence of the people who by about 600 or so referred to themselves as Angli, the English, and who were speaking a language which we now called, call Old English. The earliest evidence for these people comes about half, an, half a century earlier, some so around about the middle of the sixth century, about 552 or so, the Greek historian Procopius, um, writing in Byzantium, referred to a delegation of Angli who visited the court of the Emperor Justinian. You can see him in the mosaic there um, in, in the Eastern Roman Empire. And then by about 600 AD, you can see on the left is the Codex Rafensis. These are the earliest known writings in Old English, and they are uh, the law codes of King Ethelbert of Kent. And one assumes that they were written in English because they had to be understood by everyone. And so that assumes that at least by 600, most people in Kent could speak or understand English, it need not have been their only language but it shows it as a living language already by about 600. And the whole of this process of emergence is set within the 200 years from about the withdrawal of Roman administration and the army from Britain round about 400. And then the emergence of the early Anglo-Saxon kingdoms round about um, 600, 650 or so. So it's a two, 200, 250 year period. Well, now the conventional narrative for the emergence of the English people, their language, 
and their cultural transformations after 400 are predicated on the migration into England from Northwest Europe of a people who in the literature are conventionally called Anglo-Saxons. And this has always bothered me a bit because it was, it's not surprising that there was migration. There's been migration into these islands for millennia. So what was so special about that migration? And that was the question that got me going. So this lecture explores the solidity of the argument for that conventional narrative. And it's about premises. It's about the things we take for granted in making an argument. So I'm looking at the things that we take for granted in this conventional story about the emergence of the English. Well, you see, this is all about how one interprets evidence, isn't it? And so now here we have um, the Lady of Shalott. So now the Lady of Shalott is a bit like archeologists and historians. She's of course the, the central figure in Tennyson's poem of the same name and her curse was that she was not allowed to look out of the window. She could reflect what she saw in the window in a mirror. And from that mirror, she then wove her tapestries. And that is what we are like. We are not participants in the past that we study. We can't see it at first hand. We see it only at second hand in the artifacts, the documents, the earthworks, the visible evidence of what is left behind. And it's only a partial set of evidence. We don't know the totality of it. And from that imperfect set of evidence, we then create a narrative. <clears throat> and that's fine. I and mean, narratives are important because they help us to, to work through problems that we can see in dealing with the evidence. The problem comes when we start to believe that the narrative is a universal truth. And that's the thing that the story about people arriving in this country around about 400 from Northwest Europe has become. It's, become. it's become a kind of universal truth that one isn't really supposed to challenge. And that's the question. So that's, the, the, that, that's really where I'm coming from. I want to look at the assumptions underneath that story. So I'm making two premises. I'm taking two things for granted. The first is that there has been continuous immigration into Britain since the end of the last ice age. And I'm happy to talk to you about the premises at some point about where, you know, why I think this, but at the moment I don't have time for it. So I'm just gonna tell you that's what I think. And the second premise is that much of the people of the population of this country, but around about 400, trace the larger part of its descent from the earlier populations of Britain. Their ancestors had lived here. And in amongst that population, there were all the people who had migrated into the country over those millennia, who had been assimilated into the communities that they, that, that they arrived among. So those are the two things I'm taking for granted. One is that migration had been continuous. And the second is that the large early medieval population was native born. And then I got some questions. These are the questions that I want to ask. Was there a change in the volume of the migratory flow? So if we know that migration was continuous across that period, and the narrative, the conventional narrative ascribes all cultural change to this particular migration, do we know that there was a change in the volume? Were there, were there more people coming over from Northwest Europe than before? And does that drive the change? Can we, can we see that change in volume? Was there a change in the regions of origin of immigrants? Most immigrants came from all over. They didn't just come from one part. But again, the narrative anticipates <clears throat> migration from particular areas, dominated. It, 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 it assumes a domination of the migratory from, from particular areas, areas of Northwest Europe. Can we see that in the evidence? And the third question is whether there was, whether we can identify a significant cultural impact as a result of immigration. That is, does the emergence of the English depend on the migration of people from Northwest Europe? So those are the three questions I've asked. And there are two principles that I follow. The first is Finberg's wonderful sentence 
about clearing our minds of preconceptions. Take the evidence as it comes, see where it leads you, and then think about what it means. Don't go into this expecting an answer. And actually at the end of it, I should say that I'm not going to give you an answer about the emergence of the English, because I don't think at the moment we know one. And I'm going to show you why I think that. And the second question, sorry, the second principle I'm adopting is that of Occam's razor. Which I, by the way, I just love that cartoon. Um, so the principle of Occam's razor is that the model that makes the fewest unfounded assumptions is the most likely to be correct. Doesn't mean it's true, but it's going to be the nearest approximation to what happened. So if you make one assumption, another assumption, another assumption, another assumption, and then you have an, a conclusion, then there are too many ifs that you have to prove. If you're only making one if, then there are fewer uh, foundations for the argument to depend on, and that's more likely to be true than one where you have to make a series of assumptions. Okay, so that's my introduction. Now, I'm going to be looking at four sets of evidence. The first is documentary evidence. The second is archaeological. The third is genomic, that is DNA, and um, also isotopes, which we'll come to in a moment. And the fourth is about language. Where does the language, the, the, the um, scholarship, historiography, as they say, of the language of Old English. So that's roughly where we're going in most of the section, which covers most of this talk. Well, the documentary evidence from Britain itself for that period between 400 and 600 is very sparse. There are fundamentally two primary sources, two sources written by people who were actually there at the time. And the first is the memoirs of St. Patrick. So let's talk about him first and then we'll come to Gildas and then to Bede in a moment. So now, Gil <clears throat> Gildas, Patrick. Patrick was a Romanized Briton. He came from somewhere in Northwest England. His father was Roman, a Roman citizen. He had a Roman name. He was called Calpurnius. He was a, 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 a local administrator. He was a landowner with a villa. He was a member of the Christian church, a deacon in the Christian church. And Patrick was partially educated and brought up speaking vernacular Latin. He thought of himself as a Roman. When he went and lived amongst the Irish, he said that this wasn't quite the same as living amongst Roman people as in England. So that's Patrick's story. And the thing about Patrick is that he was um, kidnapped when he was about 16 and then came back to Britain in his early thirties and then eventually went back to Ireland as a missionary. So he talks about why he went back and he talks about how his family thought about that decision. The one thing he does not say is, they pleaded with me to stay because I was young and I could defend them against those awful people who come over from Northwest Europe. He doesn't mention that at all. The world that he describes is fundamentally stable. He does talk about raids from what we now call Scotland, but he doesn't talk about people from Northwest Europe as a problem. And the reasons that his family wanted him to stay was because they loved him, not because they needed him to protect them against any external threat. So the world of St. Patrick is one of stability, one of continuity with the late Roman, Roman British past, even though Roman administration and the, um, and the army had been withdrawn. The second source is that of Gildas. So now Gildas was writing um, perhaps not quite a century after St. Patrick in the early sixth century. Nobody's quite sure what the date is and they don't quite know where he was born, but they think he was eventually um, a member of a monastery, a monk in a monastery somewhere in Wales. So now Gildas is a very frustrating source. It was impossible to date. Um, he doesn't mention any dates that can, that can be validated. Um, it's impossible to corroborate his evidence. Um, and the book is not his book, um, The uh, Ruin of Britain. It's not about, um, it's, it's not a history. It's not intended as a history. It's a set of sermons. 
It's about what will happen to you if you stop behaving like a really civilized Roman person and you start behaving irregularly. So it's about the punishments that God will bring on people who don't obey the norms. Now, Gildas is usually cited for three elements of the conventional narrative. The first is that Saxon troops were invited into late Roman Britain, sub-Roman Britain, sometime in the fifth, fifth century, that they took over, that they fixed their claws into the land, um, and that they settled in Eastern England. So those are the three principal elements. There are more, but these are the pre pre three principal ones. And each one of those has been comprehensively refuted. So for example, Professor Nick Hyam, amongst others, has demonstrated that rather than being invited in and then making themselves at home, those Saxon auxiliary troops were billeted on civilian households and they were supported, their food and their pay came from taxes that were made on civilians and that this was the Roman way of doing things. So even though the Romans had left, the army had gone, the local people living here, the people in charge of the towns, the administrators, the governors and so on, were simply continuing to follow late Roman military practice. They were neither invaders nor colonists. And at the end of the period, the local people were in enough control to be able to send those people, those auxiliaries home. Gildas actually says they went home. Uh, the fixing their terrible claws was reminds me a bit of Mask, um, Morris Sendak. Uh, yes, so the fixing of the terrible claws, um, Dr. James Harland has shown that this was a rhetorical device. So Gildas uses the terrible claws twice, the phrase, he uses it twice. The first, he uses for Roman or late Romano-British formal generals who were using these auxiliary church, uh, troops to maintain order within late Roman Britain. And th that Gildas thought was fine. That's exactly what they should have been doing. And then Harland argues that the second use of the terrible clause is to counterpoint, to set it as an, um, an example which demonstrates a difference with what the norm should be. And that is that local kings were employing Saxon auxiliaries to undermine the Roman order. And he was terribly cross about this. This is absolutely not the thing to be doing. So the reason he uses this phrase is in order to show what should be doing, what, should, what people should be doing rather than what they should not. And the third element of Gildas, which is quite interesting, if you go through Gildas and you add up the number of attacks and where they came from, bearing in mind that he used most um, pieces of evidence twice, because he's not writing a history, he's writing a moralizing sermon. Um, so he's just looking for examples to support his, his, his morals. Anyway, so if you go through Gildas and you count up how many times he mentions people uh, attacking forces and where they come from, almost all the people that he talks about who attacked Britain in the period that he covers were Picts from Scotland and Scots from Ireland. So don't worry about that, but that's how it worked at the time. And there are only one or two references to what he calls Saxons, people who were coming over from Northwest Europe, and whether they actually meant Saxons from Saxony or whether it just meant Germanic speakers, we don't know. Instead, if you look through Gildas and you look at the society that he's talking about, you'll find that there's a functioning late Romano British administration, there's a functioning judicial system, that there's functioning um, church, there's a functioning church, the religious structures, structures, and the landscape is productive and settled. There are judges with courts and prisons. There are church hierarchies with bishops and priests with churches. There are monasteries with monks. There's a military hierarchy organizing and managing troops. There's wealth and prosperity across Britain. So from those two sources, it's difficult to see any evidence for what is conventionally called the adventus the arrival in Britain of large groups of people, or sufficiently large groups of people from Northwest Europe 
in order to take over the, um, the, the ruling structures of the country. The third source is, of course, the Venerable Bede. Now, Bede was writing about 200 years after um, Gildas, so he was writing in 731, and he was unable to corroborate any of Gildas' sources, yet Gildas was his principal source. So basically, Bede doesn't do anything to add to our understanding of the period between 400 and 600, which was already 130 years before his time. And so um, Professor um, Sims Williams says that Bede adds very little and still less of real value. He says, I'll just read you his bit. He says, his text is of value for what can be inferred from it of dynastic, heroic, and topographic tradition. So Bede used Gildas and then he used praise songs and oral histories and so on, but he wasn't able to use evidence that would corroborate Gildas. So it's good for understanding the sources that Bede used, but his text is not useful for understanding what happened between 400 and 600. And then there is a series of continental sources. Now I won't talk about most of them, um, but I can, if you want me to, but I won't because it takes too long. Um, and, but the most important one for the purposes of this evening is the life of St. Germanus of Auxerre. So now St. Germanus um, was sent to Britain in about 430 to put down um, a heresy here. And what did he find? He found a Roman administrative structure. He found a military hierarchy, an organized army, organized on Roman lands. He found churches, shrines, a church hierarchy with monks and monasteries. He talked about attacks from the Picts and the Saxons which he helped to repel. And then at the end, he says, St. Germanus left Britain, went back to France and left behind him that most wealthy island rendered secure in every sense. So the reading of the primary sources suggests that Roman administrative and military structures continued to evolve and adapt across the post-imperial centuries, no doubt into new forms, but people still thought of themselves as being part of the Roman world. Okay, so that's my conclusion about that. So for none of those three questions, is there an answer? We don't know if there's a change in the volume of migratory flow. We can't tell whether people came from somewhere different and we can't tell if they had has made a significant cultural impact. We just don't know what the answer to those questions is. So moving on to the archaeology, I'm going to be looking at uh, three aspects of archaeology, because there are plenty more than the three I'm looking at. Landscape archaeology, which is my own specialism, burial archaeology, and material culture, that is the things that people used. So the landscape archaeology. All the signs are in the landscape that there was no change in the landscape between 400 and 600 AD. If new people came in, took over the kingdoms, and as took over the, the rulership, as it were, of early medieval England, that does not show up in the landscape. You can see it in the Norman conquest. You can't see it between 400 and 600. I'm not saying there weren't changes. There were changes, but you can't see an abrupt change like that. And so this is the example of Caxton in Cambridgeshire. And here you can see the Roman road running through here from north, northwest to southeast. And you can see how it cuts this field into two triangles now. That's really quite unusual. Most farmers like a square field or a rectangular field, they don't like a triangular field. So generally speaking, if you can make a square out of two triangles, then the square is older than the triangle, than, than the road. So here we are, this road is later than that underlying square. But you might say, oh, well, you know, one square doesn't make, make a story. So no, indeed it doesn't. So let's see if some of the other field boundaries repeat that pattern. Are they on the same alignment? And you can see the dark green lines Yes, they are all on the same alignment. 
And that suggests that this prehistoric field system, it may only be Iron Age, that this prehistoric field system survived the Roman period, was continued to be farmed, those field boundaries continue to be respected through the Roman period, through the early medieval period, through the medieval period, and then into the early modern period and actually right almost up to a parliamentary enclosure. And some of those field boundaries are still there today. They've been continuously used for at least the last 2000 years. There's no evidence of the Adventus in the landscape. And the same is true also of the commons that were shared amongst um, multiple graziers. So here we are um, and in, in North, Northeast England and Cumbria. And here the, the pollen evidence shows long-term continuity in the exploitation and management of natural resources. The same grasses, the same mosaics of grasses growing across these fields for at least 2000 years. And when you find that, Dr. Terry O'Connor has said that this is deliberate. Those kinds of grasses don't grow the same for 2000 years, unless that is what the farmers want it to be. This is long-term management and it's long-term management across the whole of the first millennium AD. There's no sign here of a break in usage or in changes in ownership across the period between 400 and 600. There were changes in the landscape, of course there were, that's what happens in history, but there wasn't a sharp break. So that brings us then to the burial archeology. span And uh, there are two sorts of evidence for that. One is um, from DNA and another is from isotopes, which we'll come to in a moment. So when this cemetery at Oakington in Cambridgeshire was excavated, <clears throat> it was a, everybody was buried on the same alignment. They all had the same sorts of grave goods and it was impossible to tell where people came from. It looked as though this was just a local community, all using the same stuff, just buried as time went on, neighbors, families, and so on. But when they looked at their DNA, they found that this one, this orange one up here, had a DNA which seemed consonant with prehistoric Britons. This one here, the blue, had DNA which was partly um, partly uh, early medieval and partly from prehistory. And then only these two came from Northwest Europe. But if you hadn't done the DNA, the incomers were unidentifiable. You couldn't see who they were by grave location, by the burial rite, or by their grave goods. They weren't all buried together. One of them wasn't of higher status than the other. They didn't have very special, very rich goods because they were the elite. They were invisible in their community. They were assimilated into their communities. And the same is true when you look at oxygen isotopes. Now, oxygen isotopes are found in the enamel of people's teeth. And what they, um, they do is they uh, enable people to see the particular characteristics of the water in the area in which one is brought up. So it's quite a general, quite a general sort of um, Test because of course you know water comes from really fairly, you know, tell you it comes from northern Britain or you come from Scandinavia but it's not going to tell you the exact place. Here at Ely, we whoops sorry, here at Ely we do have one of those very high status burials. So here we are, this young woman, she's buried on her own. She's got a barrow over her and some very rich finds. She's definitely much higher status than everyone else. But where does she come from? She's British. So if you look at all the blue ones, they're all people who come from Britain. Most of them come from other parts of Britain. Only two, the two brown ones, are local to Ely. The others have come from other parts of Britain, including our young woman over here. The green ones, they come from Europe, but they don't all come from Germany or Denmark or Northern Holland. Some of them come from, um, sorry, from Bavaria. I think there's one from France, I can't remember now where the others come from, but they don't all come from Northwest Europe. And then there are two, these purple ones, who come from North Africa. So if one is looking for evidence of an elite takeover of 
early medieval England by immigrants from Northwest Europe. It is invisible here. If that sort of theory were right, we ought to have a Northwest European here and everybody else somewhere else. And that is not what one sees. Dr. Sam Lucy and Professor Sam, um, Andrew Reynolds wrote a book about this in about 2000, which is a really very interesting read. And they say it's increasingly difficult to think about fifth and sixth centuries in Eastern Britain as consisting of highly distinctive ethnic communities. So what they're saying is people were assimilated into local communities. They weren't a group of Northwest Europeans in one village and a group of Romano Brits in another. People lived together. And then we come to the material archeology, span which is what the stuff that people used with every day or, or that was special. Now in the material archeology, span there's supposed to be a, a complete break more or less between late Roman Britain and the early medieval period. But increasingly evidence is showing that there was continuity as well as change. I'm not saying there wasn't change, clearly there was change, but there was continuity too. So for example, the pot on the left is a first century Romano-British style of pot and its wheel thrown, but it was made in the sixth century before it was buried in this grave in Bedfordshire. So wheel thrown pottery, which is supposed to stop more or less immediately in the early fifth century, continues to be produced right the way into the sixth century. And it's produced in specialist centers and exported over large areas. This um, enameled escutcheon from the Sutton, Sutton Hoo hanging bowl on the right is enameled. And enameling was a Romano British technique, which persisted into the early medieval period. So there, I mean, there are plenty more examples that I could give you, but for lack of time, I won't. But in essence, what the archeology span shows is that there's continuity of Romano-British craftsmanship and techniques alongside an adaptation of new ideas, which is based on an increasing preference for goods from Northwest Europe. So people began to like stuff that came from across the North Sea rather than stuff that came from Rome or France or you know, parts of the, of the Roman Empire. So the question is whether that preference for North Sea styles is a consequence of immigration or domination by a Northwest European group. So what I'd like to do is just to take um, a rather simple example, which like all analogies is imperfect. And this shows the argument that um, so-called Anglo-Saxons only used Anglo-Saxon stuff. And um, it shows the North Sea upside down. This is from a map from Professor Tom Williamson. It's a very nice map because it shows all, sorry, you can't see my hand, can you? It shows all the rivers debouching into the North Sea from Europe. And then it shows all the rivers going into England because of course, as everyone knows, the Anglo-Saxons rode up the rivers to wherever it was that they settled. And the, um, the blue dots show brooches, particular sort of so-called Anglo-Saxon brooch and their distribution and whoops, and their relationship with the rivers. Cause obviously if they were meant to come up the rivers the finds ought to be on the rivers. So really the question is whether you can say that because something looks like an a, a Northwest European thing. It must have been brought by a Northwest European person because that Northwest European person was just refused to use anything else. So that's the first, this is the conventional narrative and you'll see these, this, things have moved on a little bit since then, but the fundamentally that you'll see these maps which are distributions of various sorts of um, early medieval artifact against this kind of map. So here's another map and it also shows lots of red dots and they're also on the rivers. So now these are the sites of Ikea maps in England in 2018. So now let's imagine that we are here 2000 years hence and that all documentary evidence for our own period has disappeared and archeologists are beginning to dig up 
Britain, or this part of England anyway. And what they find are clusters of Scandinavian Swedish, that is, Swedish stuff, which is where the stores are, and then a declining distribution as one goes away from those stores of the same stuff. And of course, they could say, oh, yes, well, we were in, you know, Britain was invaded by Swedes and they set up these elite centers. And if you wanted to be anyone in 21st century Britain, you had to be in with the Swedes and therefore you had to buy their stuff and maybe speak Swedish. But of course, we know that that's not the case. We know that this is simply the evidence of trade and that the reason that the density of these IKEA goods diminishes as one goes further away from the shops is because it's harder to carry things further than it is to carry them from when you're nearby. So when one goes back to looking at the relationship between this map, sorry, this one. So one goes back to looking at the relationship between what are called Anglo-Saxon goods and the adventus, the goods do not prove the immigration. They might do, I'm not saying they don't, but if you want them to prove the immigration, you do actually have to prove it. You can't take it for granted. You can't say, ah, oh, yes, the goods must mean there was immigration. That doesn't work. So what does the archeological evidence show? Does it show the evidence of the Adventists? Was there a change in the volume? Did people mostly come from Northwest Europe? What was their cultural impact? Well, actually we just don't know. Right, so here's the DNA evidence. So now this is work done from very famous papers published in 2016, where people compared um, a sample of from, uh, DNA from various towns in England and Wales um, with, um, and Scotland, sorry, uh, with DNA from other parts of Europe. So modern DNA today. And here's central England down the bottom here, which is where um, these, Germanic settlers are supposed to have lived. And as you go up, you can see, here we go. This is the color, that GER3, that is supposed to be, well, that it, you know, that, that's, that's DNA that looks like DNA in modern parts of Germany, which as everyone knows, is where people say the immigration came from. Now, the problem with this is twofold. Um, the first is that if you look at the volume of DNA there, a much higher volume of DNA appears to come from France. So the um, but um, so so the researchers said that they just left the French DNA out. They didn't include it in their calculations. They wanted to find out what proportion of Britons were had, had Anglo-Saxon DNA. And therefore from that to extrapolate um, the proportion of uh, people, you know, the, 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 what they wanted to prove that the Adventists had happened. But then they left out a significant part of their sample. And the reason they gave was that Bede and Gildas didn't say that the Saxon migrations involved people from France. Well, now, excuse me, you just can't do that. You can't say, well, now that piece of evidence is inconsistent and so we won't include it. You have to take it on the chin and then make a theory from it. But you can't start with an attempt to prove something that you've read in Gildas and Bede and then leave out the evidence that is inconvenient, despite the fact that the French contribution is three times larger than that from Northwest Europe. So that paper really has to be recalculated and reissued, in my view, in order to achieve the goal that the researchers wished to achieve. And then there is an additional problem for that paper, which is in reconstructing what happened in the past, the ancient genetic composition of past populations from modern DNA. And the example comes from Iceland, so in Iceland, everybody has, has an app on their phone uh, where they can see whether somebody is related to them or not. And that's obviously because of small population, so they want to make sure that um, people aren't too closely related if they should become involved with each other. However, because it's Iceland, they did also have a pretty complete data set of ninth century Viking DNA from the early settlers. And when they compared the modern DNA with the, Iceland, with the ninth century DNA, they found that 50% 
of the ninth century DNA was not represented in the modern DNA. So if you're using the modern DNA to explore, to, to, if you're going to extrapolate ancient populations from modern DNA, a large part of your sample is actually going to be missing. When you come to your conclusion, you've only got about half of what you should, should be finding. And that makes a final conclusion, a definitive conclusion about the proportion of so-called Anglo-Saxon DNA in modern Britons, very controversial. And then finally, um, there's a very nice, well, it ought to be a very nice um, study where people took ancient DNA, which of course exactly what one wants, um, and try to try to work out uh, when, you know, to, to try to pinpoint the adventus. So they did it taking um, a group, uh, which I've circled in red, from Oakington, from that same cemetery I showed you before. Now, if they were going to be measuring um, the impact of Germanic immigration into England, they should be looking at the end of the Roman period and then comparing it with the early medieval period. That's the measure change from here to there. And then that way you would be able to see if people came from Northwest Europe, but they didn't do that. <clears throat> they took a late Iron Age group here and an eighth century group from up here. So the, the maximum period across which they're measuring change is over a thousand years, which does nothing to answer the specific question about what happened here. And the minimum period that they're measuring is the 650 year period. So they're measuring from an Iron Age base to an early medieval base. And the whole thing cannot pinpoint the Adventus. You want to pinpoint the Adventus, then take a Romano British cemetery, there are loads of them, and measure it across that instead. So the genomic evidence, does that show us a change? No, it doesn't. Does it show us where people came from? No, it doesn't. We just don't know the answers to those questions. And then there is language, because people always go, ah, ha, ha, they say to me, oh, ho, what, what about the fact that we all speak English? Well, well, what about the fact that we all speak English? The prevailing explanation for the emergence of, of Old English is that it was introduced by a small dominant Northwest European elite who spoke Old English or its precursor. That was learned as a second language by suburb, subservient late Romano-British communities in order to make their way in the world. And that is obviously because the, the, the assumption under that is that that Northwest European elite refused to speak anything else, only would speak Old English. If you wanted to get along, you had to speak their language. So there are a number of problems with this, not, not many of which I can go into now. But what do we know actually about the emergence of Old English? We know it can't have been introduced by immigrants because those immigrants came from all over. They weren't all speaking some precursor of Old English. It wasn't an imported language, at least not by these supposed elites. We have no idea if it was the language of an elite. It may have been, but it may not have been. We just don't know. And it evolved during its use as a second language by speakers of Britonic and vernacular Latin, because Britain was a multilingual country in the early medieval period. People spoke Britonic, they spoke Vernacular Latin, of course they spoke vernacular Latin. The place had been under Roman administration for 400 years. And then they began to learn to speak Old English as well. So what languages did they speak? Most of the um, assumptions of the linguists are that most people spoke Britonic, but actually there's, um, and, and, and from that, uh, they say, oh yes, well, there are hardly any Britonic place names and therefore it shows that Old English was of higher status, but actually, what happens if you ask the question, well, what languages did they speak? Let's look at place names. And all those red dots there, which is in southern central England, the area in which these people are supposed to have settled initially, their primary settlement areas, these are all the Latin derived place name elements in southeast England. People spoke a lot of vernacular Latin. And how does that change the assumption that people 
were Britonic speakers who learned Old English as a second language. There is evidence of that. I'm not saying that didn't happen. But what if you add late, late um, spoken Latin into the mix? What does that say about how Old English evolved from whatever its precursor was? And the second problem with it is that language is not an index of eth ethnicity. You can't tell somebody's ethnicity necessarily by what they, by the language they speak. Um, I suppose if a, a, a country is monolingual, as Britain largely is, um, you probably can. But um, I come from a multicultural, a, a multicultural and a multilingual country. And when one looks at English spoken in Europe, so the map on the left shows the percentage of English speakers in Europe and the lighter the, the shading, the fewer there are. But look at Scandinavia. I mean, here's, um, here's Sweden. More than 80% of Swedes and Danes, Danes speak English and Dutch. That's not because we went over there and colonized them. It's not because we, we, we were an elite or we sent elite groups over there to take over their institutions and insisted that they speak English as a consequence. They speak English for a number of reasons but colonization is not one of them. And the second is, here's a language, which is Swahili, which didn't, um, which didn't emerge as a consequence of colonization or immigration, but as, an, as a trading language. So the most ancient Swahili is here on the island of Zanzibar, and then it spreads into East Africa. You can see the um, national languages are the dark green, and the trading languages here are the light green. This is a language that developed from trade, not from colonization. So I'm not saying that Old English was not an imported language. Maybe it was. But I am saying other explanations are possible until you have isolated every, have you, until you have explored every single explanation, you can't be sure. So how did it happen? that Old English emerged. Well, we just don't know. So when we look at the questions for that period, overall, was there a change in any of those things? Well, actually we don't know. And in order to interpret the past, we need narratives or explanations. We need to construct those explanations, interpretations on the basis of premises and evidence about which we can be reasonably certain. And if we can't be certain that the event is, advent has actually happened, then actually maybe we need to be looking at the evidence again and trying to work out a different or at least another way of approaching this problem. So the conclusions, given the available evidence, are that there was stability, evolution and adaptation of late Romano-British institutions, culture, languages and society. And the picture on the right there is of, uh, I believe to be, of King Ethelbald of Mercia, who died in 757. And Professor Martin Biddle has suggested that it's a multicultural, a diverse image. It shows him with three elements, Roman, uh, Roman or as in this case, um, Eastern, the Eastern Empire, Byzantine elements. It shows him with Germanic elements and it shows him with at least one Romano-British element. So his horse, the dynamic movement of his horse, his facing us, that stance on his horse, his diadem, he's got a diadem, I know you can't see it, but he does have a diadem. Um, his saddle, his pleated skirt, his neat hair, all those things are Byzantine in origin. He's comparing himself with a Roman empire, sorry, a Roman emperor. Germanic, his hose, can you see he's got those crossed socks? His hose, his shirt, his short sword, there's the, the CX there, those are Germanic. But then we've seen the influence from Northwest Europe. And his moustache, he had with a proper handle for a French moustache, um, that is British, but also Germanic. So this is not a man who's interested particularly in showing himself as 
with one sort of ethnic identity or another. That's not what he's interested in. What he's interested in is what the meaning of each of these things is and what that says about him as a ruler, as a king. It's a fluid social identity. And all of those things happen in the context of a growing preference for those cultural objects that came from the regions that bordered the North Sea. So I'm not arguing for continuity without change. I'm saying that there was continuity, but that change also occurred. And that if we want to really understand the past, we have to be sure that the evidence does what we say it is, is doing. We have to make premises that we can explain at very least. And we have to also think in terms of the long time, things that happened over long periods of time, land use, for example, agriculture take, take, um, take long periods of time to evolve. In terms of medium term change, climate change, shifts in culture from Rome, Mediterranean to the North Sea, um, the evolution of um, kingship and other institutions from Roman into the modern period, and then also short-term events. For example, the Justinian plague um, or flooding or whatever. There, there are going to be all those things, be short-term, medium-term and long-term change. And if we on, I want to really understand the past, we have to take all of those into account, look carefully at the evidence and also be sure of our premises. So I don't know the answer about the emergence of the English. What I am saying is that I think this is a fabulous opportunity for all of us to have another think about the period, to discuss, to debate, to criticize each other, and then see where that leads us. And that's, you know, that who can ask for more, especially in a lockdown. Thank you. Thank you, um, Sue, for an astonishingly illuminating lecture. I'm still absorbing um, some of your points, and I think when you started off with the idea that migration is constant, um, that just seems like something that no one can argue against unless a country sort of is literally sealed with walls. Human beings are always on the move. Um, so I, I read your book before this and now I'm absorbing some of the points for your lecture. We have time for very few questions now in four minutes. And I wanna start just by reading one from Rebecca Todd who was one of the authors of the DNA paper. And oh, yeah. this is more one for you to comment on. She writes, as one of the lead authors, oops, it, the question has just disappeared. Where, where, where have we gone? Um, watching with an alum on the Leslie paper, I actually agree with you. There is a tendency to overinterpret genetic results. I think we went too far. Oh, that's very nice, I suppose. My, I was on tenterhooks. Um, I should say that um, the, the team told us earlier that um, the questions that we couldn't take this evening, would we could answer them. Um, we, you, you keep disappearing. You keep disappearing into the grass, oh. maybe. And so um, that the, the questions we can, um, we, we, can we can reply to them after the session, after the lecture. Um, if they won't be lost. We'll keep yeah. them all and we will answer them. Okay. We'll probably have time for just just maybe two or three more before before we do the final thanks. So I'm going to read one from Will Evans. The traditional period of the Adventus was 400 to 600. I wonder if we could extend that earlier into the fourth century for increased flows of immigration from Northwest Europe. Is there any evidence that the Roman garrison in Britannia was increasing its recruitment in this fourth century period and recruiting or importing auxiliaries from Northwest Europe. Yes, yes. I mean, I think that everybody agrees that that is the case. And the question, of course, is the extent to which those auxiliary troops were withdrawn uh, to prop up what was happening on the continent after 400. Um, but, you know, that's, and now, that, you know, by all means, make a theory out of that. I haven't got a problem with that. But, it, you know, that go start, if that's your starting point, go with it. But just make sure the argument is absolutely solid as you go through. You can't get an answer just because, and I'm not saying you do this, Will, but I see it so often that you can't get the answer you want. You have to get the answer that is. Yeah. Um, let's see now. 
we have a question from Neil Carey. Would part of the answer to this reopen debate be a more robust statistical analysis of DNA in a larger sample of fifth and sixth century burials? Yes, that would, that would be great. Yes, please. And, you know, just choose a proper time frame, please. Choose late, you know, choose the late fourth century, say to the end of the, of the sixth or whenever, but then don't make it Iron Age, please. Yes, please, it'd be super, go for it. Um, we need to, it's 29 minutes after the hour. So I wanna thank Professor Westhausen again very much for a wonderful talk and remind everyone that the recording of this event will be available on the York Ideas YouTube channel, which you can access by searching for York Ideas on Google. I hope everyone enjoyed the talk that you'll come again to another York Ideas event through the Open Lecture Program. And there's more information and details of those on the website, York Ak Uk events. We'd also love to hear your thoughts on the events and to continue the conversations using the hashtag York Ideas. Thank you to everyone who came on Friday night and many, many thanks to Professor Sue Westhausen